president and CEO of the Arizona Council Economic Education, ACEE. On behalf of this evening's moderators, Dick Foreman and Summer Fawcett, I want to welcome and thank everyone for participating in this important discussion on teaching for economic equity. We're so glad to have with us today diverse representation from schools, districts, businesses, nonprofits, other state economic education councils who share the same mission as ACEE to reach and teach every student to achieve economic equity through financial and economic education and empowering teachers. To give some background behind this six part teaching for economic equity series, as you know, many of us were saddened and very concerned by events occurred this year. We asked ourselves, what can we do to make positive change? We know there are many underlying factors behind economic equity, such as race, ethnicity, geographic location, access to infrastructure, healthcare, and education. In this series, we are focusing on education, especially economic and financial education. I was discussing this topic with my peers at a conference recently. Many didn't know how to approach this seemingly heated topic and didn't want to make mistakes, which is an honest place to be. We realized we can't do this alone and need to work with organizations such as the schools, businesses, nonprofits, and government entities together. That's how we designed this six part teaching for economic equity series. Today's part one may be ambitious to accomplish under one hour, but we are actually intentional about this. We're not going to share a lot of data to get today. There will be many opportunities to share fresh data in the future series, which we will talk about later. Today's conversation starts with three amazing and hardworking Arizona teachers who are at the front line serving a remarkably diverse student population every day. Their bios have been shared with you. You'll get to know them, their work, and their students more in the next hour. Please feel free to contribute your questions and the comments in the chat. My co-moderators and our team are monitoring with me to either respond you in the chat or present your questions to the panelists or follow up with you today. So now without further ado, over to Summer Fawcett, External Affairs Market Manager at Comerica Bank, AC Board Member, and Dick Foreman, President of the Arizona Business and Education Coalition, to start a conversation with our panelists, Julia Wright, from Washington Elementary School District, Jamie Leverington from Mesa Public Schools District, and Daniel Bonfig, Flagstaff Unified School District. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you everybody for being here. I am very excited. Thank you so much for having me, um, Elena and ACEE. And you know what, I'm gonna jump right into the questions. I'm very excited because this is a short time frame, and I wanna get all the questions answered. So um, Julia, Jamie, Daniel, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna start with Julia. Um, so if we're ready, let's go ahead and get going. Uh, so for you, Julia, you used to be a business owner, which I found absolutely amazing, but could you please tell us how you decided to become a teacher and then what your experience has been as a middle school teacher? Sure. So I'm Julia Wright and I teach at Mountain Sky Middle School and I owned a marketing and printing company, but after 20 years, I was kind of looking for a change. My own children were involved in several activities and I found myself as a frequent volunteer for Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, First Lego League, and just about everything they were involved in. While I was working on my master's degree, many of the people in my cohort were teachers, which sparked the idea for me to get my post-baccalaureate teaching certificate. I thought at first I'd be a science teacher, but I happened to meet our school principal, Mr. Mason, at a district hiring event, and he presented me with a unique opportunity to develop an entrepreneurship program at Mountain Sky. 
Uh, in my first year, I had all the typical struggles of a first year teacher while also developing the curriculum for my program. It was definitely the definition of building McLean as it flies. And I spent weeks over the summer, my first summer before teaching, and creating all of these wonderful lessons. And they were absolutely perfect had I actually been teaching high school. So I was very fortunate uh, to find the resources from ACE in my, my first year that helped me kind of better align my curriculum to those middle schoolers. And, um, and so over the last five years, I have had the opportunity to you know, develop my curriculum, build community partnerships, and you know, also create some meaningful real life simulations like our financial fair and running a school store. Yeah, I thank you. I find that very interesting. I actually jotted a few things down because I, I forgot that I, I met you before over at one of your events. So um, excited to, to continue to work with you and what you've done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my next question is to Jamie. So you teach high school in Mesa. So could you tell us a little bit of how, how you became a teacher and kind of what your experience is as an economics teacher? Um, yes, I, I Started off, well, I, I went to college at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, I actually, I, before that, I grew up on a farm in a rural community in Wisconsin. Uh, went to a really small high school. Um, you know, kind of thinking about this topic, I did my student teaching at uh, a, a school in Milwaukee called South Division High School, um, that where a lot of students faced a lot of difficult issues with home life and finances. But I moved to Arizona and uh, decided to try to pursue a teaching career here, spent a full year substitute teaching before I was hired, uh, started out in history and things like that. Um, and after a couple of years, they asked me to start teaching economics. Uh, and fast forward to now, that's all I teach basically <laughs> uh, in, at Red Mountain High School in Mesa. Um, and I really enjoy the opportunity to teach this class. It's kind of interesting to me because this is not a class that was offered at the school that I attended. Um, we, we didn't have a program, you know, anything like this. We had a little bit of personal finance and a home net class. So this is, to me, as a, as a teacher, um, looking back where I came from, I look at a lot of the opportunities that students have in the school, um, and, you know, uh, try to encourage them to take advantage of those opportunities and be appreciative of them because there are so many things that are offered, uh, there, um, and currently, working with ACE and uh, my district, um, trying to improve uh, economics curriculum and to help other teachers um, with resources that they can use in the classroom. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And what you're doing in the school and with ACE is uh, commendable. I mean, it's, it's hard to get all these new things passed and done and approved. So thank you so much for certainly putting economics first um, and continuing on that, on that path and on that journey. So thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, my next question is for Danielle. So you teach high school in Northern Arizona. Um, and I believe you're in Flagstaff. So could you please tell us a little bit about your experience teaching student population up in Northern Arizona? Of course. Um, so yeah, I am here at Flagstaff, in Flagstaff, and I teach at Flagstaff High School. Um, how I kind of became a teacher was I actually started off wanting to teach uh, history to college students. And then my NAU counselor hooked me into uh, teaching high school students. So that stopped that. Um, and then while I was going through my practicum, I ended up um, getting hooked into economics and slowly like economics has just blossomed into something that I've found is really applicable to all students. Um, especially settling down in Flagstaff of being a lumberjack and then suddenly I'm my own oak tree here. Um, uh, what was really our, what I hope to kind of talk about with my experience is coming to northern Arizona, like more north, and um, experiencing a lot of um, the beautiful diversity that is Flagstaff, um, and learning how as a teacher to approach um, a topic that every single student could benefit from. And I say that as still a world history teacher and still hoping my kids end up traveling the world, but with COVID that's a little less likely, but I know that they can at least benefit from knowing how to budget, knowing how the economy works around them. Um, so I hope to kind of talk about that kind of experience and um, ramble just enough for you guys. That's amazing, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, your, your space in Flagstaff makes a big difference and um, teaching economics within a population that 
doesn't always get the same resources is absolutely commendable. So again, thank you for everybody. So I'm going to pass it on over to Dick to ask more questions. Thank you, Summer. And like you, I think I'll just dive in, although I did hear a story about a, a joke about economics in rural Arizona. I know that these students were not a student of Julia or Jamie or Danielle, but uh, Roger and Roy had a farmer that said, I'll sell you my leftover melons for 50 cents. You can get them to market, sell them for a dollar. And they thought that was a pretty good idea. So they went out and rented a pickup truck, bought some, you know, filled it full of gas, went over the field, got 100 melons, loaded them up in the back, took them to the store, and uh, they were sold for $100. And they, they got their uh, expense receipts together and their costs, and they realized that it cost them $100 to rent the pickup truck, get the gas, and get them to the store. And, and Roy looked at Roger and said, I told you we needed a bigger pickup truck. Okay, you, you, the economic people, I think, got that. You're going to have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> okay. Those were not students of these teachers. So I'm going to dive right in. And uh, my first question is going to go to Julia. And uh, I guess we have like two to three minutes for these, Julia and everybody. So Julia, do you have a personal story working with students from underserved families that you could share with us? So um, my story more has to do with um, disparity uh, between uh, students that have a lot and students that, that don't. Um, so I had a very eye-opening experience during my second year of teaching. Um, I had partnered my students with their table mates for a budgeting game. And during the activity, you know, looking around and I realized that I had partnered the son of the owner of a multi-million dollar company uh, in Phoenix with a young lady who had just the day before told me how she was so excited because her new roommate at her new group home had clothing that she could borrow. And they did beautifully together in that assignment, despite uh, the fact that they came from such different places. But that realization of that disparity still sticks with me today. It made me much more aware of the way I deliver lessons about sensitive topics. Um, I think you just can't assume that students have ever been to the bank with their parents or that their family has ever discussed money with them. Uh, some students only know the world of check cashing at the grocery store and getting title loans. Um, I once had a student when we were talking about goods and services and I used a plumber as an example of a, of a service and she told me that her mom paid the plumber by taking him to the grocery store and buying food for him with their EBT card. Families do what they have to in order to get by, and it's important to never make them feel like their family is doing something wrong or foolish. But you also have to expose them to best practices, which I think is a, just a really fine line to walk. Thank you, Julia. Um, that's, uh, I can't wait to hear more. This is so much fun. So Jamie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run over to you now, and uh, I don't mind telling you, I'm a class of 72 Mesa High Jackrabbit, so I'm expecting you to perform accordingly. Uh, Teachers often say, Jamie, that they learn from their students and that improves their teaching skills. Uh, what did you learn working with your students from underserved families? And do you have a story you can share with us about that? I think, yeah, every student that you interact with uh, offers you an opportunity to learn, um, learn from those students and where they come from and what they're dealing with in their lives. And um, one thing I've learned over time is to, uh, you know, if a student approaches me and wants to talk to me to make sure that I engage with them and listen and really make, you know, because there's a reason they want to talk to me outside of class. You know, not most students don't want to, I'm sorry, unfortunately, but when one does, I realize that there's a reason they're, they're, they're seeking something, a connection, an audience, someone, you know, something. Um, and so I've, I've always I've kind of realized over the time that I really need to stop whatever I'm doing and focus on them and make sure that they feel valued. Um, I think one thing that stood out recently as a personal story is, is one of the things that our school wanted us to do when we were teaching remotely was, you know, make or require the students to have their cameras on so that we could see them and interact with them and also kind of make sure that they were paying attention and that sort of thing. And one of the students messaged me during class and said, you know, um, I have little brothers and sisters and I have to watch them and help them with their classes while I'm taking this class. Can I please leave my camera off? And it kind of, again, hit me that you know what are, what are my students dealing with at home uh what are they uh going through and trying to remember to be empathetic and understanding and kind of really during the entire sort of coronavirus shutdown that's kind of been my mindset is i'll lean i'll air towards that side of being empathetic um 
give them the benefit of the doubt just because I'd rather do that than than um, maybe do the wrong thing with not under, you know be on you know not be understanding of a student that needs help. Um, I also I think this year teaching unemployment teaching like I just I taught a lesson on inferior goods earlier this semester and kind of realizing I might be using examples or things that these students are seeing at home you know and, and like you know if I give examples of people losing their jobs and trying to be really careful about how I present that in a way that shows understanding because that might be their parent or that might be their uncle or their aunt or something like that. I've had students share with me, oh, my brother lost his job, you know, at this place um, and had to move back in, for example. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, so we're going to move to Flagstaff and Danielle, and uh, having just driven that entire area just uh, like a week ago, um, I think those of us from other parts of Arizona, Pima County, Maricopa County, uh, it's, it's a very different world where uh, Danielle teaches, and the, the diversity there is perhaps as stark as it is anywhere in the world uh, when you consider uh, if you've driven through the Navajo Reservation and looked to the left or the right, you'll know what I mean. So, uh, so this is a great question uh, for Danielle. So to get to it, uh, Danielle, what is the unique challenge working with low socioeconomic status students from Northern, Northern Arizona? And in your opinion, what is the most important con country, <laughs> I'm sorry, what is the most important contributor to their success? Um. So to answer your question, I kind of relate this back to being culturally responsive. Um, in Flagstaff, there really are, I mean, in my classroom alone, um, over half of my class is a different ethnicity and not um, like speaking for my native students. It's not just I have Navajo students, I have Hopi students, I have a couple Yavapai students. Um, and it's really important for me um, from being working in Northern Arizona and having the privilege to work with such a diverse group of kids um, to be culturally responsive and to make sure that my content is approachable. So um, in that low socioeconomic idea, I have a lot of students who are from the reservation um, and talking to them about, hey, what are some wants and what are some needs? Um, they're very different needs than what we see from um, students who are uh, from a richer side of town in Flagstaff. And I think what helps all students, but especially those students who are considered low socioeconomic, is the ability to um, learn from them, as you've heard from Jamie and Julia, of like understanding that um, their existence and validating their existence of like, hey, you don't have to be this exact same kind of lifestyle as another human. These um these best practices, these economic concepts do apply to you and you just need to make that connection to your own life. Um, we do Project SOAR at Flagstaff High School and it's um, all about being culturally responsive, pedagogy and making relationships. Um, and since enacting that, like you can just see um, the light come into a lot of students' eyes when you go from, oh, the big world of monetary and fiscal policy, and instead you bring it down to them of, so do you like that you have to pay a tax sometimes? Um, and sometimes that can be an interesting story of um, guys, like, let's talk about taxes and darn tootin', Ms. Bonfig, let me tell you about the tax I had to pay to get my goat. Oh, okay, <laughs> let's talk about you buying a goat, sure. Um, and that's kind of a weird little thing about Flagstaff. Um, but at the same time, I have students who um, have parents who've helped them to set up Roth IRAs. And um, it's a beautiful, diverse system that I think helps to reinforce economic concepts of saying, hey, this really does apply to every single person and to validate individual students, I think is the biggest um, contributor to their success, to let them know you are here, heard, you are represented and I, I'm touchy feely. Like I, I adore you, kiddo. Like, and I think that really helps. Wow, that's that's a great answer, Daniel. Thank you. And just to remind everybody, and we're right on time. And I'm going to flip this back to Summer. But I know some of the uh, some great questions are already coming in for, into chat. I saw one from John Pettacone, a great education and business leader, uh, Southern Arizona. And this is just going to be so much fun. So, uh, without further ado, Summer, you, you are back up. 
Thank you very much. So that was that was great information. Um, we are learning a lot. I mean, we only can learn from teachers for the insights of children, even from our own kids. So thank you so much. Some of this information is certainly going to be continued and spread. Um, and we have our own thoughts of, of what you might say on certain things. But this next question is for all three of you, Julia, Jamie, and Danielle. Um, and I have a feeling it's going to probably be a little bit different than what we really think the answer is. But could you each tell us in your own words what you need as teachers to help your students be successful? And we'll start with Julia. So um, for, for me, I have found that support and flexibility from the administration at our school to create an outside of the box opportunity for students um, has been the most important. So the magic really happens when students can participate in engaging and hands-on experiences. Um, and that means accessing technology, having guest speakers, going on field trips, um, getting books and materials, right? So funding for this kind of thing is not always available at, at my school. And so making these things happen for my students, I have to be very creative in the way that I find resources, the way that I can get them funded. And then additionally, cutting through any red tape that might, you know, prevent us from, from doing it. Because many of the things that we do, you know, I need a school vending machine. You know, that, that was not something that was in the, the regular playbook for our, for our campus. Oh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That wasn't going to be what I thought, but I I can see what how that is a big difference having the resources and the people and like you said, people come in and talk and field trips. Um, yeah, that's 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 very true. Uh, same question to you, Jamie. What do you need as a teacher, or what do you believe teachers need to help your students be successful? Um, I you know I was talking with some of my fellow teachers at my school about this today uh, in our PLC meeting. And we kind of agreed that in Mesa, we're fortunate that we have a school you know, administration that supports us and gives us a lot of the resources. Like for example, you know, my brother taught at a school where they would give them like one package of paper and say, make this last the whole semester, you know? And we don't have to deal with that there. I've got, I can order, I can pretty much get any supplies that I want and I don't, and so I feel pretty lucky in that sense, at least where I teach. And I know in other schools that teachers have to deal with that sort of thing. Um, I think, you know, one of the resources with guest speakers, I know ACE put together the uh, speakers bureau. I've used that a couple of times and we're always appreciative to have people come in um, from the business community or from other places that can share, um, share their experience with our students. Uh, I think that's really effective. Uh, and also uh, just having those kinds of uh, online resources that, can, that you can go to to look for ideas of you know, looking for different kinds of lessons or different activities that you can do with your students is always, always nice. But I think by and large, I, I feel supported pretty well in my school and my community. Um, and, that's and that's a great answer. I mean, the fact that you're saying I don't really need anything. I think I'm doing a great job <laughs> what I'm given. I mean, I think your administrators are probably clapping and saying yay right now. <laughs> so congratulations. I know that's certainly not the answer for every single uh, teacher. And I, I have seen teachers who, uh, you know, school starts in August, comes September 30th, they're out of everything that they started with. So I have certainly seen that and it's unfortunate and um, we try to help as much as we can. So same question to you, Danielle. What do you need as a teacher to help your students become more successful? Well, I'll be really honest. Julia and Jamie reminded me of all the things I want. Um, but uh, to answer this question, I, I'd kind of chime in that I do, I am fortunate that FUSD is a very, um, considerate district. Um, and I have admin at my actual site that are gung-ho of like if a teacher has the drive the teacher like has the um the admin has the backs of teachers um and i think that's something that in other um school districts you might not see across arizona and so what i would focus on yes we definitely need resources and if anyone wants to sponsor my class um but what i would probably gear myself to is talking about that teachers need good communication um to help 
make sure students can be successful. And I do mean communication between colleagues so that you feel supported in your own site. I mean communication with families, as horrifying as that can be for, I think, every single teacher. Um, there needs to be good rapport there. And not just um, being kind and being nice, but being able to open that discussion of like, hey, your student brought up that um, maybe you guys haven't uh, had a family budget. Did you know that like you can set up a budget at a financial fitness night with us? Um, and then communication with the community. I was blown away. Um, Flagstaff, we tried um, right before COVID officially hit us um, to do financial fitness in action with ACEE. And I'm, I promise I'm not blowing ACEE, like inflating it. Um, but I was so mesmerized by like, we put out the call for uh, Flagstaff in Northern Arizona of, hey, I need volunteers to help, like to help students um, see if they really could survive because my seniors think they can. Um, and the community just like responded back. Like um, I know Gore, uh, local supermarkets, um, private businesses and, Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of the chills about it, but it was just um, really beautiful to see. And even like with what's happening now, like it's good to know that with open communication, students can be successful because we're reaching out and we're doing what we can. That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. Yeah, I absolutely love the finance. I, I think they talk about this every single time ACE is there, but I love their financial fitness in action. I think it's like the most amazing um, in-person game of life. I, I think it's absolutely the, the best thing a student can actually go through. So uh, kudos to them for putting that together and allowing this at your school. So fantastic. Um, so my next set of questions, again, is for all three of you, but it's kind of um, same coin, different side. So what do you think your students need to be successful? So I'll start back with you, Julia. All right, so for my students to be successful, um, they definitely need to pe feel empowered to advocate for their financial well-being. So my students are only 12 and 13 years old. There is no way that they're going to remember everything that I cover from my class. Um, you know, we, we talk about retirement, we talk about saving for a first car, but honestly, that's still too many years away to really be relevant to them. Um, so we, we, try to, we try to make it, um, things that they they understand saving for a new pair of sneakers saving for a new phone um but just taking those lessons and kind of locking them in their brain so that one day um they will be have enough um it, they'll be empowered you know to ask those questions and to seek help and they'll know where to seek help so to that they ask questions that they speak up and and then i would consider my work with them uh, more of a success Thank you. That's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, kids, I remember being 12 and 13 and cars were not my main focus. Housing was not my main focus. I had parents or, you know, guardians for that. So there was no reason for me to worry about that kind of stuff at that point. But um, having things right in front of them, I, I certainly agree that that is, that is a need. That's a necessity. Um, Jamie, same question to you. What do you think your students need to become successful? Um, I think one thing that comes to mind is the opportunity to share their experiences. I teach high school seniors, so one uh, lesson that I did a few years ago that I like to do each year is have them share experiences about how they got a job and like what their interview was like and why do you think they hired you or why do you think they didn't hire you uh, or you know things like that. And some of those some of those stories were really interesting. So I, I think they can learn a lot from each other and their experiences because when I do that. The, the level of interest in, in the classroom is really high because all those students are trying, they want to know that, like, what, how did you get a job? You know, like, they want, that's something they really do want to know. Um, and I think also students need, uh, you know, support from the community and from within the school. Um, uh, one of the organizations on our campus that helps special needs students, uh, they created a Mount Hoover's Cafe for them to have job skills where they can sell like coffee and snacks and muffins. And they can't do that this year because of COVID. So now they turned it into a uh, processing sort of place where people can donate clothing or food. And then students that have needs can come in um, that are recommended by teachers if, some, if a student uh, is having trouble that they can go there and they can get clothing or food or soap or shampoo or whatever they need. Um, so that's kind of a neat thing to support our kids uh, at Red Mountain. 
That's awesome. That's a really cool way to transfer that because that was a big deal of, you know, everything that popped up, what, what do we do with it now? So that's, that's an amazing way to, to kind of turn it for a positive. So that's awesome. Um, okay, Danielle, back to you. What do you think your students need to be successful? Danielle, you're on mute still. I see you. <laughs> there you are. Hi, guys. Sorry, I think um, my home Wi-Fi just got bombarded by a seven-year-old and a husband, so I apologize. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you've already asked your question, but I'm assuming you're going to ask me um, what I think my students need to be successful as well. Um, <laughs> um, so I really wish that an easy answer could be like, oh, my kids need technology or they just need new things. Um, but unfortunately, it's not that. Um, what I think my students need to be successful is unfortunately something that I shake into them every single time I teach a lesson of like, no, no, really, this matters. And um, I think it comes off a little bit more as nagging than um, anything. Like, I, I think we've all taught the lesson of like, guys, if you want to retire a millionaire, do these three things, like just baseline, if you can accomplish these three things, and you will. And I will tell you, I have yet to have um, a high school senior uh, alumni come back and tell me, you're right, Bonfig, I'm on my way. Um, which is a little disheartening, um, but uh, I think it's all about the communication with the students, what helps them to be successful, um, helps me to be a successful teacher for them too, of when they tell me and communicate with me of like Bonfig, like I don't really need to learn how to lease a car right now. I don't think I'm gonna ever lease a car, but I do wanna know how to like own a car. Um, I think it's really important that students take a hands-on approach to their learning. Um, and so with some students, I understand that they're a little afraid to approach their teachers, but I would say that's also something they need to learn for the real world of um, you have to be willing and able to take that risk like an entrepreneur to um, seek out what you really want. That risk has to be worth the reward and and I'd say that to be successful in any econ class is to take what we're saying and um, see how you can apply it. Because, yeah, like Julia said, there are some times that I talk to kids about retirement and they're like, I'll live forever. And then I point at Social Security and I'm like, but you won't. So that's awesome. Yes, you're right. I mean, it, they're, they're a day and age of procrastination. So I, I understand that what we we learn what we teach if we have 80 years from that point we're good we're good we'll do it on year 60. so <laughs> uh, thank you so much i'm going to hand this back over to dick to ask the remainder of the questions thank you summer um just uh just a reminder to everybody we're we're running close to on schedule but not quite so i'm going to combine my two questions into one question and uh, i think it'll still work so uh, we'll, we'll do the same thing that, uh, that Summer did. We'll go to all three teachers and we'll ask the same question and we'll start with Julia. And actually, this is the question I've been looking forward to most all day because at ABEC, uh, we work with business leaders from around the state and education leaders and we're always trying to find ways where the business community can, can both educate the education community and the education community can educate the business community. It's not easy. And so this question goes directly to the heart of something and I, I'm looking forward to hearing what the teacher's point of view is. The question is, um, how, can the, how can the community and in particular the business community, especially in light of what we've all been through this last year with the pandemic and so much social distancing and dysfunction and separation of all of our, our ability to meet in person, uh, what, what can we really do to help as a business community uh, given all those constraints that you all have faced? And any one of you can start. We've gone the same way every time, but maybe we should reverse the order and let Danielle start this time, if she's got internet. I think uh, if it's okay for me to take over, guys. Um, what I'd like to ask my community, I, I, like I said, Flagstaff, when you ask, it rises to it. And I'm sure any other community, when you hear what we need, is willing to do that too. Um, but I think what's really hard to 
handle right now is that there's a lot of expectations and a lot of uh, falling out of those expectations of, oh, my student's going to be on like um, a screen all day, or now my student's in danger and being person, or maybe you don't necessarily believe that. And what I think we all kind of need is just a little bit of patience and understanding that all of our time is valued and all of our time truly does matter. Um, like I've had, um, I'd love to have more businesses come into my class and speak to my students. But at the same time, I as a teacher have to make sure I hit certain standards and then my students also have to make sure that they do the things they need to do before a grown person comes into the room and tries to talk sense at them because sometimes students don't make as much sense as I think the community thinks they actually, the community probably has a good idea of if you pay attention to TikToks of how much sense kids can make right now. Um, but really, it's just this idea of I think we need a little bit of patience to understand that teachers are trying to do what we hope is best for the students and that students are trying their hardest right now um, to be students in this really weird realm. And then for businesses that keep reaching out to me, I totally want to work with you. But it's just such a new realm right now. And the connections that were once there have to be adapted for safety and uh, for standards and for content. Um, I know uh, for myself, I've had to cut big units out of econ because the kids just can't compute. Um, so if I were to ask the community, I'd ask for patience and to just keep that open communication because um, we're here, we want to. We just, it's a little, it's a little much right now. <laughs> Danielle, it was probably unfair to start with you because I think Flagstaff would be a perfect example of how difficult assimilating a pandemic and all, and how do you get the business community involved? It's a perfect uh, Petri dish of what can go right and what can go wrong because it doesn't take much to throw it either direction in a, in a community like that. So uh, let's, uh, let's move over to uh, uh, Mesa Public Schools and Jamie. How, Jamie, how would you respond to how you would like to see the community and in particular the business community maybe step up more? Well, I think, I think this is, again, I think uh, I was talking about this with my PLC today and kind of getting some ideas, trying to get some ideas from them. But you know, it, each school and each district has unique challenges that they're dealing with, and and so I think it would be best for businesses to, you know, check in with uh, the administration in the local school, see if there's something that they need that 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 business could offer that school. Um, I know in some schools, students have issues with internet access or or technology issues, and in 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 other schools. Um, it might be something else. It might be uh, food or transportation issues or whatever it might be. But kind of looking at your local schools, checking out their website, seeing what organizations are on campus. Like we have an academic booster club in our school uh, composed of parents that's always trying to bring uh, businesses or supporters from the community in and find ways for them to support the school and the students. Um, and you know, if you if you reach out to your local high school or your local middle school, your local elementary school, I'm sure that they would have some ideas for ways that you could support them. I don't think there's a one size fits all. Like this is what every school would need. Um, I think it varies greatly depending on you know Flagstaff to Mesa is going to be a lot different, I imagine. And even within Mesa, from East Mesa to West Mesa, is going to be a lot different. Um, but I think that would be the best way to to go about it. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, Julia, coming from Washington Elementary, this has got to be a good question for you because you face all these things as well. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on that question? I'm going to scrap my prepared answer and, and just tag on to what Danielle and Jamie said. Um, so with um, patients, patients especially from the business and, and community partnerships that we've already built, so many of my programs that I, you know, I have uh, a bank that comes in and talks to my students every year. Well, that can't happen this year, or it's going to change significantly. Um, my, the financial fitness in action, all the material are financial fair, but obviously it's probably not going to happen this spring yet. Um, having flexibility from the community, knowing that we desperately want to continue doing the programs and to continue the relationships that we've built, but we just have some, some constraints on us right now that, um, 
you know, there, we, we can't have the guest speakers, but being flexible, having those guest speakers instead of coming into our classroom, maybe doing a, a Zoom meeting, maybe doing a pre-recorded meeting. Um, so, and there's also, I think, from teachers, a, a great sense of loss. Um, I definitely mourn some of the fun things that I really look forward to doing with my students and in having to, you know, feel like, gosh, I wish I could do that, but we're still online. Um, of you know working with schools I think there's even if the community reaches out at this point I don't know that we're quite prepared to accept help yet so just being being patient um, because you know like in the Washington School District this is our third day of, of hybrid and so this is like the start of the school year all over again and as much as we want to to reach out and have those relationships um, we're just not there yet so I would just Patience, I think, is the, the theme there. Well, I can't even imagine. You just said something there that jumps right off the page at me, and that's the hybrid model. Nobody knows what this is. Nobody's ever done it. Nobody's ever tried to bring a class to achieve a lesson plan where X percent of your students are on a computer at home and X percent are sitting in front of you. And the I can't even imagine. <laughs> I cannot even imagine how you do that. So uh, bless your heart, but that's a this is a this is a learn as you go situation. So that that does conclude uh, that panel, and I think uh, Elena, do I turn it back to you so we can start uh, providing questions to the panelists from the audience? Yes. Um, wow. I um, Jamie, Julia, Danielle, um, and uh, you are amazing and uh, just just you you're, you're truly our heroes and uh, thank you so much for um, being on the ground and working with the students in such a difficult uh, challenging time and uh, and uh, what you shared um, and the insights and advice are um, truly truly valuable so um, thank you very much and I, I see that there are several questions, and I may call a few um, few people. We have uh, we have uh, uh, teachers, we have um, school board members, and also administrators uh, with us. And everyone, please feel free to unmute uh, if uh, you, uh, you you don't have too much uh, background noise. Um, we uh, want to start the the open discussion. And there are a few questions in the in the chat, and uh, and we can start with Dick. Would you like to um, um, present a few of these questions? Sure. I uh, I I'm going back to a question. Uh, I think the first question I saw was from John Pettacone, who was curious what the teacher's point of view, uh, John, jump in on this if I don't ask this exactly the way you want, but he was curious from the teacher's point of view what they thought the single greatest trait was that helped a student in a uh, socioeconomic or uh, uh, challenging economic condition to, to succeed. And he had his answer, but I think we'd like to hear what the teachers think. What is the trait that you notice among students in those challenging socioeconomic uh, situations, what trait allows them to succeed the best? What stands out to you? Do you want us just to jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Julia. Um, Start it I, up. I would say curiosity. Um, you know, curiosity uh, for, for how things work, how the market works, and, and also just being brave enough to, to jump in there and, and, and do it and embrace it and think that, that it's something that, that they can learn and be successful at. Jamie? Uh, I think, sorry, my son just turned the light off. <laughs> <laughs> Punish him. Oh, please, thank you. <laughs> Consequences. Uh, sorry, um, you know, I, I think, you know, determination would be a big factor um, for, student, for students. For students, I was funny, I was going for a run and I was listening to Freakonomics and uh, he was interviewing the mayor of San Francisco and she was talking about how she grew up in public housing and, uh, you know, was very poor throughout her childhood and she discovered education and kind of realized that that was her 
opportunity to get out of the economic situation that she was growing up in because she was uh, she said you know I kept questioning like why am I here how can I get out and that's what she realized and she shared that like you know her brother ended up in prison and still is in prison and and to me I think that's that story kind of hit me and I think it was the idea of you know, having that that realizing the value of education and being determined to take advantage of it okay Thank you, Jamie. And uh, Danielle, you want to you want to give us the trait that you've noticed uh, in your students in Flagstaff? What what stands out to you that gives them some chance for success? Um, oop, there we go. Um, I think for what I've seen in Northern Arizona, it's yes, it's absolutely resiliency. It's a, a self determination, um, and I've always found it really beautiful that um, with the students I've worked with, especially, they're very vocal about it's not just uh, improving for themselves. It's always improving for their family, for their um, extended family, for their community um, back home on the res or in Sunnyside, what have you. Um, sorry, uh, Flagstaff terminology for different areas. Um, and it's always been really beautiful to see that, yes, they want to do something more with what they have, but it's always, I want to do better so that my mom can, like, take a break. I want to do better so my little siblings don't have to experience this, and that's always been something, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not an English teacher, so I apologize. I, I should have, like, read up a bit more, um, but that's something that I think, um, is a core component of the students I teach of yes I want to I want to try I want to they're self-motivated but that motivation actually comes from outside so that they build up. Great answer and uh, I'm going to ask one more question then I'm going to turn it back over to Summer uh, so that we can uh, uh, do our usual flip back and forth and uh, Summer can wrap us up with questions she has but I love this question about uh, what financial and economic information do you think is most needed for the parents? And, you know, if, if you're teaching a student, it's one thing, but if their parents aren't supporting it or the parents don't provide some of the basic foundations, it, it probably makes it a lot more difficult. So I think that's a great question. Uh, who would like to take a stab at that one? I can start with that because I see it because I was a sophomore uh, in high school right one now. One turned off the lights, maybe? No, that's my, uh, that's my seventh grader, so. Oh, yeah, he's ahead. <laughs> I both of them. But um, <laughs> I think... Uh, what I would like to see from parents maybe a little more is, is, is um, encouraging or just being aware of opportunities that are there for their, uh, for their children to take advantage of in the schools. Um, for example, uh, we're, we're, we have a program where they can partner with Mesa Community College um, to enroll in uh, college classes. Uh, it's called Early College Academy. And we have 3,000 students in, um, well, in my son's class, there's a, roughly 900 to 1,000 students. There are like five students total in his entire class that are in this program. Now, of course, he's in that program because uh, I was <laughs> signed him up for it. <laughs> but he's, if he does the program, he'll end up getting 34 college credits when he graduates from high school um, total. Uh, he's enrolled in two classes now. Uh, and it's, it, to me, I don't know, it's a sort of a, I think a shame that more students are involved in that because you look at the cost of college education, we get a subsidized rate or a discounted rate for the classes that he takes. Um, and, you know, there, there should be more, you know, and I'd like to see more involvement. And that really comes from parents, I think, being aware of, you know, paying attention to what's being offered and trying to get their students involved or their kids involved. Great, thank you, Jamie. Julia, anything to add on to that? What do you, uh, what do you wish the parents, what do you think they need? Um, I would talk about money more with, with their, their children, um, have those discussions be available for their children to ask questions. Um, also, I was surprised at, at the beginning of the year, I did a, a little survey of my students, just a little bell work question at the beginning of class and asked them if they had the opportunity to, to earn money, like, you know, could they babysit or mow lawns or something? And the vast majority of them said that they did not have money op earning opportunities. So if they don't have the opportunity to have their own money and to make decisions about their own money at a young age, where the decision might be just throwing away, you know, $20 on junk at the mall or, or candy, um, where they can learn from those, those decisions early, um, it's not going to be until they get their first 
income, their first job, that they're going to be making these decisions with higher, higher stakes and bigger consequences. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. And so, Summer, uh, you're batting cleanup. I'm tossing this back to you. All righty. All right. So I do have a couple questions here for you guys. Um, let's see here. So um, one, of the, one great question is, what do you wish you learned before you became a teacher? And it could go for anybody. <laughs> or basically, what did, you, what did you wish you knew before you became a teacher? Um, all right, as a second career teacher, um, there is nothing that other than actually teaching that could have prepared me for teaching. Uh, it, um, I, I did my post-baccalaureate teaching certification through Rio Salado, which was a great program, but it, uh, you know, my student teaching was done in my own classroom, so I was thrown to the wolves. But the, I mean, the nice thing is I came in it as a grown-up, you know, I, I was not, you know, 21, 22 straight out of college. So, you know, I had, I had some work and life experience to kind of back me up. But um, I, I think there just needs to be more time. There's, there's such a shortage of teachers that teachers are thrown into teaching without the, the proper, you know, training and experience, really more experience than training. Like I said, Rio Salado did a fine job, but um, just having that experience to work with a master teacher uh, is something I missed out on, and it was probably a harder road than it had to be. But um, yeah, just just experience and, and working with um, with others. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, we, Thank we can jump in anytime, whether Daniela or Jamie. Well, while you are thinking about that, Jamie and Danielle, um, I uh, want to call my um, Valley leadership uh, classmate and uh, Tori, if she is still here, because uh, everything we have talked about so far, it just I, I can't uh, help thinking about. Um, she is a former teacher and a book. Um, that uh, she published recently it's called a learning to connect. And, uh, uh, and it's all about um, the teacher and their relationship with students. Um, and uh, if Tori, you are there, do you, uh, do you see some uh, what, what has been shared and in the research you have done? You are mute. Okay. Uh, I think you're still muted, Tori. Okay, did that work? Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much. I've been really inspired by what the teachers have been saying. Um, you guys are doing amazing work. Uh, one thing that really stands out to me is how much you're talking about connecting with students and their families. So that emotional piece, that empathy, um, understanding where they are, understanding that there's a variety of reasons that they wouldn't want their cameras turned on during virtual learning, these kinds, of, these kinds of really understanding, thoughtful, relational pieces of teaching are the bread and butter of teaching. I was a teacher, I loved, I loved that port more than anything else. And um, I can tell that you're all really amazing teachers because you think so much about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tori. And, uh, um, and I, 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 I just, it's, it's amazing. I just finished actually reading your book, uh, Learning to Connect, and literally all the examples uh, that Julia, Jamie, and Daniel shared. And I just remember, yeah, I read about that in Tori's book. And so uh, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, no and we have some school administrators and uh, board members actually um, with us too. Monica, um, uh, if uh, if you're still there, um, love to uh, um, to to hear what you think about or any questions you may have for us. I don't think she's here anymore. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and anyone, please feel free to jump in. Um, and, I mean, this is a, a very efficient group we have. Wow, we are just right on time with uh, five minutes to, to close. Um, and uh, Danielle, Jamie, uh, Julia, do you have any, any final comments 
for all of us. Uh, just thank you for uh, the event. It was really uh, interesting to participate and learn from my fellow teachers and, and to have this opportunity. I did think of, I was trying to think of something that I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known that I was going to be an economics teacher when I was in college. I would have taken more economics classes. <laughs> so um, my, I, my main focus was history uh, and the way my major was structured, I had to take four economics classes total. Uh, so I did like the micro macro and a couple other ones, but I would have taken more classes <laughs> if I would have known. But anyway, but it's fun to learn. I, I, you know what, like Julia said, I think, uh, I don't know if it would have helped me as a teacher because I would have had to learn on the job anyway. Because um, uh, those first couple of years of teaching is when you learn, I think, the most. Uh, uh, I was 23 when I first started and had to learn fast. <laughs> so thank you for, again for hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, um, I want to, oh, oops, um, just uh, want to put this up here. Um, uh, talk about the uh, uh, upcoming um, programs we have planned in this series. And uh, um, I, I, I highly recommend uh, uh, to hear your thoughts um, uh, on what we are planning. And if you would like to partner, we, we learned that um, teaching for economic equity um, it's really important that we partner with uh, different organizations uh, to uh, help us move forward and move uh, this conversation forward. Um, Race and Entrepreneurship is a, a program, um, actually the Thomas R. Brown Foundation University of Arizona uh, is, uh, uh, has invited uh, Dr. Lisa Cook, who has done a lot of uh, research on, on this area, uh, so that's going to be on January 14th. Um, the history and the economics of the civil rights movement is a curriculum, some uh, excellent lesson activities for high school social studies teachers. Um, that's going to be uh, in January. We actually uh, launched this program last year and it was very well received by the teachers. So that's coming up. Um, the financial education policy event, the intended audience, is legislators, influencers, and educators. Um, it's uh, going to be co-hosted by the National Endowment for Financial Education and uh, Council for Economic Education. Um, and the representatives from other states will be joining in this uh, policy event. And the focus is going to be on the financial education's role in the access to post-secondary education. So stay tuned for that. Um, and we are working with the universities um, uh, and the Federal Reserve Bank on the economics of income inequality and uh, race and wealth. So still stay, stay tuned for, uh, for these opportunities. And we would love to hear your feedback. Um, uh, we are putting the evaluation link in the, in the chat. We uh, want to... Um, we want to know what you think this uh, program is. Um, it is the first probably in the, in the country and we have uh, other states actually on the call with us and they want to, they want to see how we're doing and uh, to, uh, to, to modify and launch <clears throat> this program in their states too. So we love to hear your feedback and uh, your interest in, in partnering with us. And uh, with that, I think uh, we are uh, concluding um, Teaching for Economic Equity Part 1. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon again. Thank you.